Well, good morning again, church. It seems like peace is the order of the day after our children's program beginning the service about our chaos and his peace and then lighting of the peace candle followed up with Conrad's devotional mention carrying into communion concerning peace. Peace and order is what we're getting at today and it's no less reflected in the sermon that you're going to hear today. Last week in our Christian Living 301 series we talked about a subject that was so integral to our Christian faith and that was forgiveness. We examined Ephesians chapter 4 verses 29 through 32 regarding that and we saw that regarding forgiveness we are to forgive as we've been forgiven. Now, in order to address this week, we're going to need to look at those same verses again, but in a little different emphasis, with a little different emphasis, a little different context. So if you turn in the Bible this morning to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, the statement for this week is statement number 8 of our 12 that we're investigating throughout this series, Christian Living 301, and statement number eight is this. Get rid of anger, arguments, and slander. Don't intentionally try to hurt another person physically, emotionally, or spiritually. I just want to let that statement soak as you look at it for just a minute. There was a day when wounding another person was not glorified as it is in our day. I just saw an arrest of a young man in our country who's been going around striking people, punching people unexpectedly from the back, unprovoked and violently, and he's just been arrested, but he was doing it simply for a few more views on his social media account. There was a day when disagreeable dialogue didn't devolve into an attempt to destroy your opponent. Rob Orison is always talking about in men's group his frustration with how folks are elevated for having quote unquote destroyed or owned another person in a debate or disagreement. There was a day when differences were expected, respected, and reflective of diversity and thought and experience without the need to critically cancel someone or cause them some other form of harm. There was a day when virtuous things were valued, when dignity was not dormant, when honor was honorable and manners were more common than being ill-mannered and obnoxious. But alas, we live in a time where the living Word of God seems to be coming true, and if not here, certainly very near regarding our behavior. Paul writes to the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5, through 5, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And that is just in the church. I'm kidding, I think. But what a sad prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes. How descriptive of our culture, the people that make up our culture today. And, and yet, I'm sure our parents would have said the same thing, wouldn't they? And maybe even their parents, our grandparents, and maybe the generation before them. And you know what? Each generation was probably correct because it seems that we are devolving 
in respect to respect. We're on a fast train to the days of Noah, and it's a ride straight down the track. For Jesus warned, in Luke chapter 17, verse 26, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. What was it like in the days of Noah? Well, read this. The Lord saw... Genesis chapter 6, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. And... They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all with no concern for the righteousness or justice or judgment or wrath of God until they were swept away. For mark this, in the latter days, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud and arrogant, and on and on and on it goes again until the Apostle Paul adds a tagline at the end to what? Avoid such people. Avoid these kind. And God forbid if these kind of people are the kind of people that make up our churches. And that's why we need a reminder. A statement such as, get rid of anger, arguments, and slander. Don't intentionally try to hurt another person physically, emotionally, or spiritually. The biblical mandate to live this way can be found in Ephesians chapter 4, which is our text today. I want you to lay your eyes on it, if you will. Again, we used verse 29 in Ephesians 4 a couple weeks ago in regard to our message on speech. And you'll remember what it says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear it. So you remember that message about speech, not letting that corrupting talk, that filthy, dead, decaying language, that garbage come out of our mouths that destroys, that tears down, but instead the mouth that blesses and builds up. And then last week we used verse 32 in Ephesians chapter 4 to talk about forgiveness. It says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now, sandwiched in between those verses, 29 and 32, are verses 30 and 31, which fit the context of our message today. Look at it with me. It says in verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. It sounds a lot like our statement, doesn't it, about ridding our lives of arguments and anger and slander. It pretty much encompasses what our statement is saying. But I want you to notice the last part of that phrase in verse 31, where it says, along with all malice. The word there for malice is kakia, and it refers to wickedness, or even more, a vicious disposition. That is the kind of evil that seeks to hurt another person viciously, maliciously. 
And church, that doesn't have to mean bodily, but we talk about other forms of it as well, emotionally, spiritually. And how many times have Christians, and we're not talking about the inadvertent stuff where it just kind of happens, it slips out or whatnot. We're talking about those vicious, malicious type attacks that break down, tear down, and destroy other people. How many times have other Christians engaged in that kind of behavior? How many times have other churches maliciously, viciously, purposefully engaged in that kind of behavior? There are some that are just simply vicious. Some people, some churches, without caring about our concern. And that, my brothers and sisters, should not be. Now you might ask, what about church discipline? What about those vices that were mentioned early on in the Timothy passage? What about those kind of things? Are you saying that they should not be addressed? Are you saying that we should ignore those and just go along to get along and be nice? one another you might say isn't that why kids are the way they are today because they're not being disciplined by their parents or won't the church end up the same way if we don't address those vices what about those don't they need to be yeah yes they do but that's not what we're talking about we're making a distinction between addressing those vices that we mentioned early on and also not tearing down or maliciously harming and hurting another person. And those two things can be joined. They're not uniquely distinct from one another. Vices can be addressed at the same time that we build others up and not maliciously, viciously, or purposefully tear them down. You see, even Christians need to, at times, be called on that proverbial carpet, if you will, if they're in the wrong, if the vices are dominating their life. We may need to address those things, but it's for the purpose not of tearing down maliciously, viciously, purposefully, but for building up. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 reminds us, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Restore in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted as well. Now notice what the concern is. It's a concern for restoration. It's a concern for building back, not tearing down. Even the Apostle Paul addressed a horrendous situation in the church at Corinth, unlike anything we were probably ever going to experience. And yet he did it at first with discipline concerning the vice, followed by building up of the person. In fact, we probably need to lay our eyes on it. So if you would, go ahead and turn back a few pages, just a few pages in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll start reading verse 1 and see what we're talking about here. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, says, It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. And here it is. For a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Are you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. It sounds like what Paul said to Timothy about those vices listed. And he says, have nothing to do with such a person. That's what's happening here. Remove them from among you. Boy, doesn't that sound like tearing down? No, it's addressing those vices spiritually, purposefully, but it's not about tearing down. Just keep reading. Verse 3. For though absent in body, I'm present in spirit. And if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. 
so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter, jump down to verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world. They're just going to do what they're going to do. You would have to avoid the world, and that's what he said. I'm not referring to those in the world who are sexually immoral or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world to get away from such a thing. Verse 11, But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or as an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not to even eat with such a one, avoid such a person, send them, remove them from among you. For what have I to do with judging outsiders, verse 12? Is it not those inside the church whom you're to judge? God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you. Now you may say, that seems pretty destructive. That seems pretty vicious, pretty harmful, and purposeful. But not if removing a person from his vice leads to his salvation and repentance. And that seems to be what happened here. Because if you turn over to the next book of Corinthians, the next letter, 2 Corinthians Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and look with me. 2 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 5. Most scholars believe this is addressing the same issue that he just addressed in 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. Excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. Now, if anyone has caused pain... That is by his conduct, by his behavior in the church of Corinth. He has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the, by the majority is enough. The fact that you've sent them out, that you've avoided them, collectively, that's enough punishment, Paul says. So, verse 7, you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you're obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I've forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his design. So what we're talking about here today is so much more than simply fluffing stuff, kumbaya, get along, go along to get along. Be nice to one another. We're, we're talking about vices and virtues, virtues and vices. And in a day when virtues used to be valued and now vices are displayed, we need to get back to some godly living where we live up to the calling that we have already received. Because we know Satan's scheming is to accomplish otherwise. See the way Paul ended that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11? We don't want to be outwitted by Satan, for we're not ignorant of his designs. What are Satan's designs? Well, they are to steal and kill, to deceive, divide, and destroy, to burden, blind, and make bitter to oppress and obsess over self, that is to cause pride, to woo people and produce pain, to choke the word, to counter God's will and kill your witness. He embraces anger, is joyous over jealousy, and espouses selfishness. He twists, he tempts, and he turns away from the good. He is arrogant and abusive and unholy. He accuses, slanders, and is swollen with conceit. In fact, the world is beginning to look a whole lot like Him. And so, the church, this church, 
has a magnificent opportunity in this ever darkening domain of the enemy to stand out as distinct, as different. That is where we give and produce life where we speak truth and unite and create hope, where we unburden, open eyes and forgive, the church that grants freedom and selflessly lives, thinking of others, wooing people and producing fruit, holding forth the word of life to encounter God's will and have an assurance and answer for the hope that we have. For we embrace goodwill, we turn away from greed, and we espouse that selflessness. We unwind the ways of the world to reveal truth and turn toward that which is good. We are humble and heartened and holy. We heal instead of harm and bind up instead of tear down. And we welcome instead of cast out. That is what Christian living looks like. That is what Christ living in and through us looks like for the apostle peter encourages us having escaped that's you and me having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire because of those vices that are becoming ever more so apparent because we've escaped that for this very reason. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. That word virtue there is a moral excellence which is displayed to enrich life. Moral excellence that enriches life. Isn't that what Jesus accomplished for us? May He live in and through us as well. Let's pray.